Hello and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest vox casting either side of the breach. On today's episode, we continue the story of Malifaux Burns. Last time, we learned of dire portents brought by the gigant Euripides to Titania, the Autumn Queen. On this episode, our story takes us from the powerful officials at Guild Headquarters to an encampment of the dispossessed in the quarantine zone. I hope you enjoy the continuation of Malifaux Burns, right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Breach Side Broadcast is brought to you by the Malifaux Journal of Applied Natural Physics. We are currently seeking research papers on a wide variety of topics, ranging from glacier formation to fluid dynamics in the seas of Malifaux. Your paper will be reviewed by some of the world's most preeminent scholars, assuming they're still alive. Governor General Franco Marlowe checked his watch. 5.40. By the end of today, she'll be mine. Much like its owner, Marlowe's timepiece was not at all ostentatious. The band of grizzled rawhide was frayed around the edges, and the copper ring that circumscribed the ivory-coloured dial had become dented and worn. But its hands never wavered, and its gears never jammed. The trinket had been with Marlowe for nearly two decades, as the most powerful politico in Malifaux, the Governor-General could have easily bought a new watch, perhaps one made out of gold, or even more ostentatiously, one decorated with fine soulstone fragments. But that would have been an enormous, unacceptable waste. The thought made Marlowe's stomach curl. If only the damned pompous fools under his command understood that power was an obligation, not a prize. Gratuitous wealth meant nothing. Legacy. The physical impact of fulfilling one's duty was everything. All else was meaningless noise. Marlow had tried hard to teach others this truth. For too long the guild had rotted away from the inside, encumbered by Vienna's self-destructive decadence. Why was it that institutions were so resistant to change, even when the status quo was an intolerable weakness? Every day he fought tooth and nail against the rivals who had levied against him since his very first day in office. Yet he had already brought most of them to heel, while fulfilling his obligation to bring this untamable city to order. Marlow quickened his stride, nodding to the occasional officials whom he passed while making his way from his office toward the crown room on the opposite side of the governor's mansion. A few ministers nodded respectfully as he passed, the newly promoted High Treasurer, Mathieu Monastus, tried to flag him down. Sir, he began, clearing his throat. I have finished balancing the old accounts. But Marlowe held up the wrist, displaying his watch, and shook his head. Not now. I'm nearly licked. Though before departing, he added approvingly, Well done, Monastus. I'm sure Herman left them a mess. The High Treasurer understood immediately and respectfully let him be with a gesture of thanks and no further complaint. Marlow soon arrived outside the heavy double doors of the crown room. With both hands, but without ceremony, a familiar motion, he pushed past the heavy knotted wood and tempered iron. He found the space as it had always been under his tenure, busy and bustling with a flurry of activity like a beehive. Today it resembled the war room of a battlefield headquarters, Various maps of a single tenement in the city's Southgate district hung from the walls. Most were annotated with arrows, crosses, 
circles and other hastily scrawled notes. The long oaken table that bisected the crown room was abuzz with conversation. Various senior executives were milling about the ledgers scattered atop it, frantically scribbling and comparing notes. In the centre of the table sat both an ethervox unit and a model of the same area depicted on the maps. Coloured tokens appeared to represent different squads of guild guard. A throng of officials were huddled around the model, engaged in a heated debate as they shifted the tokens around. Several of them looked up after hearing the creaking of the crown room's enormous doors. The rest of the occupants immediately snapped to attention, and a dampening silence fell upon the staffers, like a close ego upon a rowdy storm. What news? Marlow barked. There was no sound but for the chattering of the ethervox, which pulsed with the occasional discharge of static. The Governor-General walked with a brisk stride to the end of the table, where he clasped his hands around the back of his chair, although he refused to sit. Don't tell me nothing has happened since I left. His tone was terse, but not arrogant. Collins, updates? Marlow cast a pointed glance at his closest aide. The man's white dress shirt was wrinkled where he'd rolled up his sleeves, and both his face and fingertips were smeared with red and black ink. A pen with a visibly blunted nib was tucked behind his right ear. All teams are in position, Collins answered. Samael's witchlings are inside the tenement, and we have snipers in some of the neighboring roofs. We're just waiting for the target to enter. What aren't you telling me? asked Marlow, eyes narrowed. He never missed a beat. Colin screwed up his eyes for the briefest second. Positioning was a nightmare. We've had to place the flanking guard patrols a few blocks away. We can't make them too obvious or she'll see us coming. This also means we won't have eyes or rears on her until she's nearby. Also, some of the bigger thralls were harder to hide. They don't like confinement, and they've injured some of their handlers. But the teams are ready to go, I assure you, he concluded. And Karis? You still think she'll come? Marlow asked, voice steady. Another man, this one named Credence, stepped forward. The bait's just too good, sir, he replied. I planted the intelligence personally. She thinks she's going to be clearing out one of Raymo's secret caches. She wouldn't miss that chance. Marlow nodded thoughtfully. All right, Credence, but this better work. Karis and her zealots have been a thorn in our side for far too long. It's a damn shame Creed's not back for another week. I'd rather that she handle this personally, but her lieutenants will do. Is Dashiell on sight yet? Negative, Collins reported. Why the hell not? The ghost of Marlowe's smile had transformed into a very visible frown. He was, but he left Southgate half an hour ago. Some sort of immolation downtown. At least half a dozen patrolmen dead. We're still waiting on details, but reports are filtering in. Possibly an arcanist attack. The flames were highly suggestive. If Karis is there, she's certainly not in Southgate. He gestured at the maps with a forlorn shrug. Damn him, spat Marlow. I've seen carnival monkeys that follow orders better than he does. He quickly regained his composure and made a mental note to have a word with the commander later. Anything else I should know? Colin shot a glance toward one of his companions, a young woman with a long black braid. Grisina, you had some news. Marlow knew that this woman was just a little too close to Lucius Matteson. He braced himself for a snide suggestion. Miss Yao, he said expectantly, arms crossed. Just thought you'd want to know that the trial of Parker Barrows is commencing by the hanging tree, said the woman. Secretary Madison opted to leave the proceedings to Birmingham. He says he's the best. She barely suppressed a grin at the mention of the lawyer's name. He and an executioner are already on sight. Ah, said Marlow, eyebrows raised. Well, maybe Birmingham can talk Barrows to death if the noose doesn't get to him first. He sat down at last. Pity we didn't snag his little green friend, too. Before Marlow could say more, the vox emitter in the centre of the room spat out a burst of static. She's here, and she just sent in two of her men. They're probably scoping it out first. What do you want us to do? Instantly the room fell silent. Hold, the Governor-General ordered. Tell me more. It's definitely her, 
the radio man said, his voice full of excitement. Blonde, shiny wings, and she's got friends, maybe half a dozen. Before Marlowe could answer, he interjected, Wait, wait, there's more movement. Two other figures are coming out to meet her. I can't see their faces, damn hoods, but they're waving and shouting. Sir, I think we've been made. Orders! The silence seemed oppressive as Marlowe wrinkled his brow in thought. It was now or never. Sir, the Vox croaked again. They're backing away from the building. They know we're here. Each aide in the crown room glanced at the Governor General, breath baited. A few of them were gripping their chairs, knuckles white. Marlowe could not help but smile despite himself. He picked up the Ethervox unit and thumbed the speech button. Bring them in. Sour faces reflected back at him with this command, and a few started protesting. Marlowe didn't pay them any mind. We've gone over this and I won't explain myself again. Bring them in. Alive. The moment after the Governor General gave his command, the Ethervox crackled to life once more. Understood. And sir, you won't believe it. One of the newcomers is took... Before the captain could finish his sentence, an ear-grating explosion radiated from the speaker, and the line went completely dead. When he arrived in the southern bayou, the man known as English Ivan experienced something that was, at least for him, extremely rare. Genuine surprise. It was not often that he was caught on the back foot. He had dozens of strategically positioned informants. Given his rather unique way of extracting information, there was no shortage, and the job was growing easier as he learned to master his art. Most of Ivan's assets had no idea that they were even helping him. After all, who knew that their own shadow was actually alive, watching their every move and waiting to snitch to somebody who could speak their language? For Ivan, it was literally true that wherever there were shadows, there were secrets. And in Malifaux, there was never a shortage of shadows. Yet despite his extensive intelligence network, or perhaps because of it, Ivan could appreciate that some things inspired enough terror or grandeur to shock a person, even when they already knew what to expect. Some of his cleverest enemies knew about Mr. Mordrake and the Deva, but still they dared to cross the Department of Ungentlemanly Affairs. Inevitably, the last look on their faces as their own shadows sliced them to pieces was always one of genuine shock. They had indeed known what was coming, but they had utterly failed to internalize what the horror of it truly meant. This time Ivan found himself on a much more pleasant assignment. He already knew that, following their rescue at sea, Dr. Maxine Agassiz and her associates had established a budding research facility where they could continue repairs on their flagship, the Exploration Vessel Superior. He also knew that the outpost, although small, was quickly becoming a haven for scientific innovation, and the ship and its surrounding labs had become home for many aspiring academics and pioneers. He appreciated that Maxine's success and the quickly circulating stories of the EVS's triumphant rebirth were noteworthy enough for Gretchen Janus to send him to investigate. And yet, even Ivan was moved by the speed of repairs to the majestic ship and the small web of labs that had grown around her hull like the roots of a sturdy tree. The EVS was a beautiful vessel indeed. Sunlight streamed off the clockwork freighter's newly repaired hull. She towered imperiously above the stinking waters of the swamp, a paragon of innovation, hard work, and the quest for knowledge. Its radiant presence seemed just as out of place in this fetid land of gremlins, gators, and mutant pigs as Ivan was, trudging through the mud in his bowler hat and trench coat. The blazing torch and crossed pistol's logo of the society had been painted in front of the ship's name, pristinely stenciled in teal magnetic paint. Maxine may have independence, he thought, but Gretchen sure has a way of getting whatever she wants. What are you doing here? Ivan turned around and came face to face with a tall, dark-skinned woman wearing voltaic armor that exposed her rippling forearms. They were twice as thick as his own. Her hair was braided into perfect cornrows, culminating in a tight bun at the top of her head. Not one lock was out of place. She radiated the unmistakably austere air of someone who was not to be crossed. English Ivan, he said, extending a hand. She didn't take it. Kaya, she said with a brusque nod. Again, what are you doing here? 
She eyed him suspiciously. Ivan looked down and saw that her shadow had crossed with his own. This gave him an idea. Apologies, Kaya. The pleasure is all mine. I am with the society. Official business, you understand? He said, thinking quickly. His eyes fell almost imperceptibly to the ground, where his shadow completely enveloped Kaya's own. It peeled itself away at an angle that was too acute to be natural, but too subtle to be noticed, and it seemed to shudder ever so slightly. A moment later, a thought that was not entirely his own crept inside his head. Personal offices in Block A, room three to five, two floors above the commissary. Suddenly, Ivan's shadow corrected itself and rejoined its master. If you're looking for the captain, I'll take you to her myself, Kaya said seemingly unaware of what had just happened. Clearly she wanted to make sure that he did not wander. No need to bother yourself. I just have to follow the paper airplanes, Ivan said, winking. Kai's implacable features didn't budge. Right. Glad you're not wasting my time, then, Kai nodded. Off you go, little man. Good luck getting her to talk to you, though. What do you mean? Ivan called as the woman strode away. Kaya did not respond, although she did turn her head to make sure he was on a course to reach the buildings at the foot of the EVS. Feeling her eyes on the back of his head, Ivan began working his way toward the modest complex of labs, all built above the shifting mire on iron stilts. The small facility seemed prefabricated and ergonomically designed from the same sturdy girders used on the EVS. They resembled the containers on a cargo ship, but they were far more spacious and punctuated with occasional beams of wood and copper plating. They even had windows. After approaching it a little closer, Ivan could discern that the closest cluster had the large letter A painted in several places along the exterior. He made a beeline for them, walking swiftly but unobtrusively, trying to avoid the deeper mud puddles wherever he could. The entrance door did not have a regular handle, Instead, it had a wheel-based locking mechanism, like the bulkheads on a freighter. As he reached for it, he made a mental note of the word stenciled in all caps. Warning. Twist wheel to secure door, in event of tide caller incident. After Ivan entered, he passed several personnel in the cramped hallways. A mix of frantic-looking scientists in sweeping black coats, engineers donning thick welding gloves and face shields, and even tattooed sailors in overalls hoisting harpoon guns slung over their shoulders. A few spared him a quick glance, but most ignored him. Ivan did not ignore them. Snippets of conversation reached his ears as his own shadow flickered over those of the people he passed. Much of the chatter was trivial. A few lines were not. Orville says he's a bit worried about her. She's disabled the Vox link in her office. Apparently she doesn't want to be disturbed. No, I haven't seen her in the commissary for weeks. She missed her check-in with our lab yesterday, again. You can tell it's getting to beep. Just exactly what was going on here? English Ivan would find out. He always did. He followed the main corridor and the smell of freshly brewed coffee to the commissary, located the closest staircase, and then ascended to the third floor, two stairs at a time. The landing opened onto a longer hall, with a single wooden door at one end. He had barely emerged from the doorframe before something came whizzing down the corridor with a graceful swoop. An instant before it collided with his head, Ivan reached out with reflexes faster than they should have been. For the briefest moment, dark smoke seemed to erupt from his arm, enveloping the projectile and drawing it within reach of his gloved fingertips. Hey, give that back! That one was perfect! The voice belonged to a short man with a long flowing moustache and soft brown eyes. They widened in acknowledgement as they took in Ivan's familiar trench coat, hat and cane. His tone changed from bemused consternation to one of recognition. Ah, Mr. Ivan! The man radiated warmth and cheer, something that could be said about very few people on this side of the breach. Orville, I should have known. Ivan looked down at the paper airplane crumpled in his hand. Still playing with these? He handed it back. Always, Orville Agassiz said jovially. 
We'll have to replicate that again, he muttered to himself. Seems like increasing the wingspan by a centimeter on each side makes a big difference. Ivan returned a smile that revealed just the right number of teeth. He patted Maxine's husband on the back. How long has it been? Orville scratched his chin. A few months, I think. Last time was at that dinner party when Max and I announced our decision to stay here on the coast. I imagine Gretchen is still upset with both of us. He raised his bushy eyebrows. Ah, that's right, said Ivan, as he made his way down the hall toward the door at the end, though he had already known the answer to his own question. Speaking of Gretchen, I assume she sent you, Orville asked. Ivan chose his next words carefully. Without proper attire, of course. No galoshes for me. He paused. Orville blinked expectantly, and Ivan politely cleared his throat. I'm here for you and Maxine, the both of you, and the EVS. have cultivated quite a reputation back in the city. Word has spread about, well, all of this. He gesticulated at the walls. It's barely been a few months. I had to see it for myself. Jesse even mentioned that three of your papers have already passed peer review. I've heard the process is quite medieval. You can tell Gretchen that her investment is paying off, Orville said with a wink. In that moment, Ivan appreciated that Orville might be kindly, but he was certainly no fool. And it's four, actually. Four papers. My latest manuscript on modelling glacier formation in the Ten Peaks was just accepted by the Malifaux Journal of Applied Natural Physics yesterday. Ivan nodded. Is Maxine around? In her office, I would wager. He pointed at the door. Yes, but she's been rather frazzled lately. She's always focused, but this time it's different. I really think some company would do her good. He knocked. There was no response. After several repeated attempts, Orville called out, Dearest, we have a guest. At last, a muffled voice answered through the doorway. It was gentle but firm, carefully disguising the stress and panic Ivan could hear hidden beneath each syllable. Not now, sweetie. I don't mean to be rude, but I really need to keep working. Any minute now, I'm expecting... Well, it's hard to explain. Ivan discerned the shuffling of papers. Nothing is more important than this, I promise you. Matt, you've been saying that for two weeks, and you haven't left your office since. You need a break. You can't go on like this, Orville replied. Harada and Kyra are worried sick, and even Beeb is perturbed. And what would I do if you worked yourself to death? He added with a hushed, affectionate whisper, seemingly undaunted by Ivan's presence. Anyway, it's someone you know. He's come all the way from the city. Ivan could hear the sound of a teacup crashing, brief swearing the screeching of a chair drawn back from a desk, and finally the click of a lock. A second later, the door opened halfway. The kindly face of Maxine Agassiz appeared before him. Ivan was surprised by how worn out she looked since their last meeting. Dark rings had formed underneath her eyes. Previously, her flowing white hair had been tamed in an elaborate braid. Now her locks were wiry and frayed. He took in the mass of scattered papers and books as well as a series of complex scribbles on a blackboard, just barely visible through the crack in the door. "'How good to see you,' she said, although Ivan doubted she meant it. For the briefest moment, he thought he saw her face twitch. By the time Maxine had taken a deep breath, stepped out of her office and closed the door firmly behind her, the tick had disappeared. "'How about a coffee?' she proposed, patting down the wrinkles in her corduroy vest and straightening the ascot around her neck. It's a little late for that, don't you think, dearest? interjected Orville. And you missed breakfast. And lunch. How about dinner instead? he added eagerly, smacking his lips. It's pork chops with apple sauce tonight. He did not seem to notice that the corner of Maxine's gaze was fixed on the sliver of sky visible through the nearest window. But Ivan did. Splendid, lead the way, Ivan gestured, following husband and wife back towards the commissary. Once Maxine and Orville had descended the first few stairs, he cast one final glance at the door near the end of the hallway. You know what to do, he thought. Without complaint, Mr. Mordrake shed himself from his master like the opaque skin of a shadowy cobra. His slender form and long, spidery fingers became one with the carpet, flat as a silhouette cast on the floor. 
Ivan's shadow inched unnaturally towards Maxine's office, scuttling in two dimensions until it disappeared completely beneath a thin crack under the door. The dreams were getting worse. In the beginning, she dreamed only of darkness. She would find herself in an infinite expanse of inky night, incapable of seeing her own pale fingers, even as she held them up just inches from her nose. This mercurial blackness was not just the mere absence of light. It possessed the physicality. It was sentient, malignant, cold. Whenever she dared to push forward into the gloom, she found herself stuck, as though caught in quicksand. Some sort of barrier obstructed her flailing. Try as she might, she could not escape. Blind and unable to move for what felt like an eternity, she was alone, exposed, and frantic. Time, space, and direction had no meaning, as darkness filled her lungs like a swelling tumour, ensnaring her senses and leaking into every fibre of her being. Then came the mercy stroke, Always at the precise moment when she realized that she could not even scream, she awoke, drenched in sweat. The ability to make any noise at all was a sweet release. It signaled that her nightmare had indeed come to an end. But just when she began to grow used to the terror, the fiendish vision changed. In her latest dreams she remained alone, but the darkness now had a voice. It called out to her with a creaking rasp gentle yet virulent, like a death rattle. She could feel putrid breath tickling the hairs on the back of her neck each time it spoke. The sound was the reverberation of ataxia, the chorus of decay, the refrain of entropy. It whispered just two words that filled her with indescribable dread. Riva Cortinas. Her own name. The words felt soiled coming from those unseen alien lips. Was it a threat? A warning, perhaps? Maybe a reminder? But of what? She did not know, and it did not matter. How could she answer when she could not even scream? Riva Cortinas. She listened to it over and over and over again. It rang through her ears as she felt the world collapse around her the darkness still overwhelming and oppressive. Riva Cortinas. I am, the young woman shouted. As she felt the air escape her lips, Riva realized that she had returned safely from the suffocating blackness, though she was far from whole. She sat up suddenly, taking deep breaths. The sight of Vincent's familiar stubbled face calmed her. His severe, pitiless countenance and glowing green eye would have been outright alarming to most. But Reva understood better than anyone the true humanity that lay deep down beneath the former exorcist. After all, it was his act of sincere compassion that had first bound them together so long ago. He was at her side, as he always was. Here, Vincent said, handing a cup to Reva. She accepted it graciously, taking a long, deep drink. The cool water helped her shed the last vestiges of the nightmare that still clung to her mind. Vincent waited until she was done before speaking again. It was the same thing again, wasn't it? The darkness. It's gotten worse, said Reaver Sally, rubbing the sleep from her eyes with her grimy knuckles. There's something lurking inside. It knows my name now, she ventured. It calls me over and over again, but I can't answer. It was horrible, but she would not sob. I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe. I was trapped. All I could do was listen while it called me. It was like when I was young, when I was in that room. She could not finish the thought. Vincent nodded sympathetically. The pair sat in silence for a time before someone just outside the tent loudly cleared his throat. A young man stood flanked by a few others, a mix of undead and living alike. Reva recalled his name was Jeremiah. Vincent turned around quickly to shield his lady from their prying eyes. It's all right, Vincent, Reva said, to put the exorcist at ease. Jeremiah, what is it? 
I'm sorry to bother you, but there's... We need you at the system, he said cryptically, departing so that she could dress in privacy. Rivers' curiosity overcame her drowsiness. After splashing some water on her face and binding her slick black hair with a freshly cleaned white kerchief, she slipped her favourite coal-coloured habit over her skinny torso. Though it had been a long time since Reva had eaten properly, the garment still fit snugly, plain but comfortable as always. She straightened the folds and patted down the creases before stepping out of her tent. The small township her people had created lay before her. Reva and her band of nomads had found this sacred place not far from the old Powderberg district that von Schill's Freikorps had once called home. For reasons she could not understand, the mercenaries had never occupied it. They preferred to construct their own fortifications above ground, making nothing of the beautiful sanctuary right in their midst. Little shacks and shanties used the natural archways of the tunnels for support. A few small murals decorated the walls. Some gardens occupied parts where silt and soil had gathered, and a bit of light from the grating above shone through. They were simple but clean and organized. Everyone tended their tasks, but stopped to wish Reva and her entourage good morning. Reva reciprocated every greeting. It took no time to reach the cistern, gaping open before her. It was a great yawning reservoir several stories underground and deep within the quarantine zone. Indeed, the cistern was the closest thing to a haven that one could find in a place as hostile and unforgiving as this. During the day there was light. The ancient builders of Malifaux saw fit to leave a great oculus in the ceiling, high above, its diameter at least half the length of a cricket field, presumably to allow water and fresh air to circulate through the otherwise damp space. Though the original inhabitants had departed millennia ago, life still thrived here. Creeping vines dangled like tentacles from the opening. They were thick as a rope, and home to a host of multicoloured flowers sprouting from the stalks. There was water, too. It had to be cleaned, though it was an abundant supply. Puzzlingly, the massive chamber itself was connected to the city's endless sewer systems, but the well at its centre was not, preserving its bounty from irreversible contamination. Reva had also chosen this space for her camp, because the position was easily fortifiable. There were only two entrances in and out, not including the open ceiling above. They had barricaded these corridors and established a nightly watch to protect the little tents and shanties that her followers had erected around the lip of the great pit. Though there were many horrors in the sewers, Reva's people had little to fear here. Her unique command of the undead was as prodigious as that of any necromancer who might threaten them. Reva liked to think that it was superior. The departed souls who fought under her were not mere flesh puppets forced into battle, as they were for others of her ilk. Even the humblest corpse fought enemies for her, not because of her. The same could be said of her loyal shield-bearers, warriors of great skill and fierce loyalty. Over here. Jeremiah's call shook Reva from her thoughts. She found him staring down into the depth of the cistern, fingers clasped tightly over the railing. While many in the camp were still bathing, dressing, or huddled around little fires cooking a humble breakfast, several of the nomads had joined Jeremiah at the edge. Look at this. Reva obliged and peered over the edge. She almost gasped. Something was floating on top of the water. It was dark and wet congealed like stale vomit, a dark purple with flecks of beet red, the colour of a severe bruise. What is that? One of Reva's followers, a gaunt teenage girl with olive-coloured skin and soft green eyes, stepped forward. Her name was Alexandra, and she had been with Reva's caravan for about a year. Her parents had died in a steel mill accident a few months before then, Reva had encountered her in the slums, abandoned and destitute. The necromancer sensed her grief and helped the young woman understand that death was not the end. She had grown strong and confident since then, 
though were still underfed. Alexandra hauled up one of the rope-tied buckets used for collecting water. The liquid inside was an impenetrable muddy brown. Chunks of the strange growth clung to the inside of the vessel. As if sentient, it began slithering up the sides, clinging to the metal like wriggling worms. Riva would not have believed it if she had not seen the growing strangeness with her own eyes. We just discovered it this morning, she said, dropping the bucket in disgust. The moss bobbed on the ripples, giving it the appearance of shifting skin. What will we do? Jeremiah asked. He was skinny with dark hair, pallid skin, and bony cheeks that signaled both hunger and grief. We can't stay here if we don't have water. He had lost his wife, Sarah, and their unborn child to the same unknown sickness. Loss was a common shared experience for all of Reva's followers. It bound them together, thicker than blood. They all simply understood what it meant to lose everything just as Reva herself had. Reva looked down into the depths of the cistern, lost in thought. Others in the camp were now crowding around the edge, all thoughts of washing and breakfast abandoned as they too gazed down in horror. Maybe there's a way to purify it, suggested Vincent. We've all sacrificed too much for this sanctuary to give up now. We're still safe here. He cast a look at the sturdy barricades covering both exits. How much water do we have left? Two or three days, said Alexandra, but no more. The others began to murmur in panic. By now the entire camp had gathered around Reva and Vincent. Christina with her own infant at her breast, Anastas and her undead brothers, the twins Esther and Jacob, and so many others all stared up at her with their forlorn eyes, begging for answers, for succor, for hope. Reva felt uncomfortable. She had embraced leadership over her cursed flock, but she was still learning to accept the weight of responsibility for their security. Reconnecting them with those whom they had lost, providing them companionship when others offered only rejection or scorn, and showing them that death was only a transition, rather than something malignant and terrifying. All of that had been easy. But providing for them once she'd earned their trust was an entirely different battle, and not one that could be won with the blades of her shield-bearers, Vincent's crossbow, or her necromantic talents. Each time she led her caravan of misfits to seek shelter in dark, dangerous, and hidden places, Reva feared failure. At every potential sanctuary she chose for her people, the same mantra of questions ran through her anxious mind. What if the location wasn't defensible enough? Would poor tactical planning be the death of them all, if never-born horrors, the creations of a rival necromancer, or outlaw gangs hunting for supplies encountered them by chance? What if there was not enough food to be scavenged there? Would she be the reason why those who put so much faith in her starved to death? Malifaux was hazardous, and moving was costly. Each time they sought new shelter, there were always people whom she had lost during the exodus. Was it worth the risk? Those who died on their arduous and everlasting journey had not done so in vain. Yet the young woman remained perpetually unsure of whether that was due more to luck than the soundness of her judgment. The moss in the cistern was more than a gross inconvenience and a threat to their safety. On an even deeper level, it seemed to indicate that her luck had run out. Riva caught herself. No, this place would be different. It had to be. Peace, Riva said to the throng, trying to keep herself steady. Vincent dragged over an old wooden crate, and Riva stepped atop it so the crowd could better see her. They fell silent at once. I know you are uncertain. I know you are afraid. But all is not lost. She felt the words flow through her. They felt rough on her tongue, but not entirely foreign. She pointed down at the cistern. There are other sources of water in this place, but we will need volunteers to fetch it. For now, be sparing with your water. 
but abundant in your faith. Try to drink no more than is absolutely necessary. I do not want to leave this place. It has become our home. Riva glanced sadly at the modest chanties that they had built, and the small collection of memorial altars that they had erected to commemorate the dead. Vincent and I will find a way to deal with this contamination. Riva suppressed a sigh of relief as the crowd appeared mollified and began to disperse. Vincent stepped forward and began taking down names of volunteers willing to go and scout for more fresh water. For the moment, things were stable but the moss inside the cistern slid and crept around the water's edge, as though watching. It was a few hours later when Reva heard Vincent's voice outside her tent. She invited the exorcist in. Please tell me you have some good news, Reva asked. Jeanette built up concern flow into her words. Vincent understood the pressure she faced better than anyone. I do. We found a few spots with fresh water. Not far from camp, but still dangerous. Should keep us going for a while yet. He wiped his face with a damp cloth. Reva was chewing her lip, prompting Vincent to continue. You have a knack for bringing peace to the living as well as the dead. You don't need to worry so much. He reached to pat her gently on the back. He was surprised to feel Reva trembling. Reva? What's wrong? I... I don't think I can do this, Vincent. I can't pretend to lead these people any longer. I feel false. They trust me, but I haven't earned it. She tried to avoid his gaze, and looked instead at her hands. If I can't fix this, I will have to put them all at risk again. Remember the plague rats? And that encounter with those machine zombies that I couldn't control? How many did we lose just to find this place? I remember each and every one of them, said Vincent solemnly. But even more than those we lost, I remember those who are still here. You'll find a way. You always have, he concluded gruffly. Riva nodded, but couldn't find any solace in his assurances. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for the continuation of Malifaux Burns.